It is my pleasure to welcome you all to uh, a, a panel entitled, this is one of our two healthcare panels, obviously my area of interest being healthcare a physician. Um, this panel is entitled, uh, The Nurse Practitioner Will See You Now, and the question is, can empowering APRNs save lives in Texas? Our uh, panelists are uh, people that I really hope you will enjoy hearing. They are uh, truly expert in what they're about to say. First, there's Ann Dunkelberg, Ann, um, uh, who is the Associate Director for the Center for Public Policy Priorities, um, and her focus is healthcare and specifically healthcare access. Uh, before, I didn't know this until I read your bio. Before uh, Ann uh, joined uh, CPPP, she worked at the state uh, Medicaid director's office. I didn't know that, but I didn't know, and might, might be interested, is she was apparently the primary author of the, shall we say, lovingly called Pink Book, which basically tells you everything you ever wanted to know and a lot of things you didn't want to know about Medicaid. True. Your first edition. Um, uh, she is a native Texan, received her BA from the University of Texas in Austin, and MPA from the LBJ School of Public Affairs, obviously UT Austin. We have, uh, um, I'm saving the Y chromosome for last. Um, we uh, have Representative uh, Donna Howard, who has served in the Texas House of Representatives since tw uh, 2006, currently chair, uh, vice chair of Calendars, the very important committee and a key member of the uh, House Appropriations Committee, a native Austinite, uh, Representative Howard earned her bachelor's degree in nursing, please note nursing, uh, and a master's degree in health education uh, at the University of Texas. Uh, she worked as a critical care nurse at uh, Breckenridge and Seton Hospitals and as past president of the Texas Nurses Association. Holly Jeffries is uh, the equivalent of what we would call a real doc, namely she's out in the real world taking care of patients. Uh, she is a registered nurse since, uh, um, Holly on the end, um, uh, since 1997 and an advanced uh, practice registered nurse since uh, 2002 when she completed her doctorate at the University of Texas. She's a certified uh, family nurse practitioner and leads a multidisciplinary healthcare team providing primary care services to underserved rural areas across the whole Texas panhandle, a rather large area as we all know. Holly serves uh, on the healthcare advisory board for the Lieutenant Governor and is chair of the Texas uh, Nurse uh, Practitioners Government Action Committee. Finally, last but certainly not least, my friend, um, you know, I didn't even know your name was Gerald until I was, uh, everybody calls him Ray. I mean, anyway, uh, Dr. Gerald Callis uh, is a practicing anesthesiologist in Beaumont, Texas for over 16 years. He received his bachelor's from Texas A&M, go. And um, you, t you know, we have this big thing in TBPF, the Longhorns versus the Aggies, anyway. Um, being neither, I can adjudicate. Um, uh, got his uh, doctor, um, MD, from uh, UTMB in Galveston, uh, where he's recognized as the most outstanding resident. Uh, Dr. Callis is a medical director for several medical facilities in Jefferson County, also serves on the board of directors of Anesthesia Associates and the board of trustees of Texas Medical Association, and just recently the governor added more on his plate, appointing him to the board of the Texas uh, Department of Licensing and Regulation. So I don't think Ray is going to get any sleep for the next several years. Um, you can put yourself to sleep. I just figured that. <laughs> All right, let me, let me uh, do uh, a couple of things. Let me set the stage just with a couple of sentences, and then um, Anne is going to add to that, if you will, setting the stage with a couple of slides, and then we're gonna talk about what are we gonna do with the problems that the two of us are going to explain in, in some detail. Namely, Texas has uh, 254 counties. 29 of those 254 counties have no doctor at all. 28 of them have one doctor. Two thirds of our counties in this great state are declared either partially or completely medically underserved. 
So we have a, uh, an absolute, if you will, shortage. In addition, we have an uneven distribution of the doctors we have, 228 doctors per 100,000 population in Dallas, and in Hidalgo County, that number is 42. Uh, less than half of Texas physicians will accept Medicaid patients, new Medicaid patients. They take care of the ones they have now, um, as they should, um, which leaves a huge number of people with basically nobody to care for them. And millions of Texans are currently forced to do without for the issue because of the lack of access, timely access to uh, primary care. Anne, you want to? Oh, you got a, no, you got, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, here's your clicker. I promise I won't take long. So let's see what we've got here. I just wanted to provide a little bit of context in terms of, you know, we have worked on this issue for several years uh, with a number of organizations, including TPPF, and so people are always intrigued by the fact that groups from different parts of the political spectrum are interested in this issue. And so my perspective comes from access to care, for Texans, and this is your latest census data pie chart of how Texans get coverage and which ones are uninsured. Uh, so I would just point out that, you know, we have uh, 4.7 million between Medicaid and CHIP uh, under our census data. We have 4.8 million uh, uninsured, and then the the sort of orange slice, burnt orange slice that says non-group, that's people who buy their coverage directly from an insurance company, and that can either be literally buying it directly with no middleman because there's no subsidy, or through the Obamacare uh, marketplace where the subsidies are available. It is the same insurance for the most part that's being sold in the so-called individual or non-group market. So really, if you look at that group, at Medicaid CHIP and at the uninsured, those are the three groups that are the most disadvantaged in terms of having adequate access right. to all the providers that they need, which is not to say that people with employer-based group coverage never have any problems finding providers. They <laughs> certainly do, and certainly rural areas are the most likely to have a problem. So I just wanted to make sure you had those statistics. Unfortunately, we slid backwards a little bit in 2017. Our uninsured rate got a little bit worse. Um, it's interesting to know that the uninsured rate for Texas working age adults is more than twice what it is for kids. The reason being that kids have access to Medicaid and CHIP and we really don't have much of any coverage for most adults in Medicaid in Texas. So these are the populations, uh, again, that, that are a high concern for me. The reasons, you know, that I come to this conversation are because, you know, broader availability of services from advanced practice nurses, nurses can bring down the cost of care, that we have just a phenomenal, whether you like it or don't like it so much, the bottom line is that the track record in Texas is we have reduced and reduced and reduced government spending over the last decade, and there's not going to be a big influx of cash into Medicaid uh, at least through our state budget. So if I want the folks on Medicaid as well as the uninsured and people in, in direct purchase insurance to have better access to care, I can't afford to leave a major source of cost effectiveness and good care on the table. Uh, and basically I've just reworded what that last bullet said is that you know letting them practice to the full extent of their licensure, it will help stretch our resources further. And this is just a little teaser about the data situation. My brilliant coworker, Eva, did this. This is uh, LBB and controller's data. And it basically, if you look at our GR spending going all the way back to 1985 and adjust it for uh, general inflation, you find that we are uh, spending the same, about the same amount per Texas today than we were in 1985, which for some people sounds exactly right, I know especially in this room. But one of the things we point out is that we are trying to do an awful lot of stuff today that we weren't trying to do in 1985, including providing health care. So, uh, you know, the number, that, that figure from 1985 didn't include providing health care to very many children, for example, or even pregnant women. So that's just sort of my uh, lead in to the issue is that, you know, one of the consequences of having an extraordinarily lean state budget and state government is very lean programs to serve the uninsured and therefore we really can't afford to be losing, leaving big efficiencies on the table. Maybe I should, there we go. Thank you very much. Now, before we get into, if you will, 
uh, solutions, which is obviously what we want to talk about. I'd like Holly to give us a sense of what an APRN out in the real world does, if you would. Sure. Well, um, so we provide primary care services from anybody from our infants to our elderly because we are the only one. For example, one of the clinics I have, uh, well, all of the clinics we have, we are the only clinic in the county. So we don't have a hospital in our county. We don't have, um, we are the health facility. So we treat everyone um, from acute illness, if they have a sore throat, to their chronic diabetes and, um, you know, high blood pressure and things like that, as well as well exams for pediatrics, immunizations. Um, we do home health for the kids and for the adults who can't get out, and we go to home visits for them as well. All right, so I think we can all agree without uh, uh, any question that we have a crisis of access uh, in our state, uh, specifically to primary care, and that's really the focus of attention uh, for me this morning, because as we all know, the lack of good primary care makes illness more serious when it has to be, and by serious, I also mean expensive, uh, when you have to deal with it. And if you can preempt or prevent, obviously that's not just the best thing to do as physicians and nurses, but the best thing to do for our state budget. So uh, there's no question that we need to do something to improve access to primary care. And now I would turn around and, and I'm saving you for last because you're, you're the one who's gonna have to say what's possible. Uh, but I'd like to ask Ray, what do you, what's your vision, if you will, for getting care to those who don't get it now? Uh, that's, that question is a very big question that we continue to wrap our minds around. Uh, before I give you the answer, um, I sit as the president of the Texas Society of Anesthesiologists, but most importantly, my wife is a nurse uh, that is uh, educated and trained uh, uh, at a high level. Um, with that being said, what we continue to have a problem with is access due to the fact that we have to get to infrastructure first. Uh, I'm not making it a hierarchy between doctors and nurse practitioners. What I'm saying is that let's start from the very basics. Let's get communication <laughs> to our rural areas due to the fact that we passed law recently for telemedicine. Telemedicine has not been able give to Give credit work. to your next door neighbor. 100% give credit. Yes. My problem is, and what medicine's problems is, is it's about threefold, and I'm not gonna do a Governor Perry where I only give two, I'll give you all three. <laughs> uh, we're friends, so oh. I mean, uh, my, my big thing is first thing we need to do is improve communication streams to where the small communities have access to internet. Right now, I have uh, p friends of mine that practice in the rural communities. They cannot even send a snapshot, much less a video, via stream because of a dial-up connection. So I think first we have to do is improve access to our internet and improve access for our social media so we can make telemedicine work like it's supposed to work, number one. Number two, um, the rural communities continue to be a problem due to the fact that all this money that we're spending on health care is not going to the provider uh. for the most part. And whenever you want to make an argument about nurse practitioners versus physicians going to the rural community, that's not a good argument. Due to the fact, it doesn't matter who's going to those communities, you cannot maintain a fiscal livelihood if you cannot make ends meet based on payment. I can tell you right now that nurse practitioners and physicians get out of the community, you know, out of medical school or their advanced training, they're in serious debt. Mm -hmm. I know for medical students, they're about $184,000 to $200,000 in debt. And whenever you're only getting $10 from Medicaid for an office visit, and you got to pay for office overhead, you got to pay for staffing, you got to pay for all this. There's no way that physicians or nurse practitioners can go out into that community to practice. And we know that for sure because as sitting on the board of trustees of TMA and sitting on as the vice chairman of liability, we know exactly where all these people practice. 
Majority of people practice close to where they have a revenue stream. They're not going to go out to uh, Padonia, Texas, if there's only 1,800 people there and they're all Medicaid or uninsured because they don't even have the financial support. So if we're going to change this paradigm, we're going to have to come up with some type of payment that's fair for both providers so that way they have access. But, but the one thing I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater before I give you my last opinion is that telemedicine has not been allowed to work. We are still hamstrung due to the fact we don't have access from Amarillo down to Brownsville over to Beaumont where I live all the way over to El Paso. We have to have a platform to where we can have streamlined, effective, rapid communication to where we can allow nurse practitioners and physicians, but especially the ones that I call my friends, my colleagues, because I'm not making it a battle between physicians and nurse practitioners. They need to practice to the highest level of their license and maintain a physician-led care team. That's what all Texans deserve. And my final comment that I think the other big issue that we're dealing with is that we have to put our biases aside and work together because it doesn't do a bit of good to where we start deciding individual scope practice, independent practice. That's not about this game. It's about taking care of Texans. Mm. And I can tell you that I respect nurses. I respect nurse practitioners. The problem that I have is that it's still different to go to medical school and be a resident and put in thousands and thousands of hours compared to a nurse practitioner, but I'm not discrediting that. I'm saying that we need to work together as a healthcare team to deliver healthcare throughout the state of Texas. Let me, let me uh, start with your first and ask either you or Representative um, the telemedicine infrastructure, okay? Communication. Uh, on the plus side, uh, there are stories, and uh, they haven't been well uh, publicized, but I, I really, it's actually very emotional to me. The number of people whose lives were saved during Harvey because telemedicine actually got the information that was needed to a doctor who had never seen that patient before in some shelter somewhere, but found out what the dosage was, blah, blah. The point is, it really makes a huge difference. So I'm, I'm strongly supporting what you said. Now I would say, how do we arrange to make that more available more quickly? Now, whether you or the representative wanna try and uh, tackle that one, but I've gotta ask, okay, yeah, we agree. How do we do that? I'm gonna yield to representative. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would. It has nothing to do with us. It's all about revenue and, and about infrastructure and cost. Everything's all about the revenue. That's, that's, what, that's what we do at the Capitol. And it really does all come down to the budget oftentimes about what we do here. Uh, to your point, and, and you made a lot of good points, I think, about the systemic issue we're dealing with here. There is not a one answer to the dilemma we're facing here in access to health care. Making sure that, that we are in, uh, allowing all of the health care providers that we have now deliver the kind of health care that they're qualified to deliver is absolutely an important part of this. But to your question about telehealth and connectivity, this last legislative session, it's in the public education arena, but we had access to E-rate funds, matching E-rates from the federal government. And, and being on appropriations, one of the things that I was able to, to, to ensure happened is we appropriated $25 million and it was matched by another $225 million by the feds. And we now have probably close to 95% of our school districts now have broadband connectivity. Uh, we have significantly increased the opportunities we have for our schools to begin to get into the 21st century and have equalized access to the kind of, of instruction that they need through that connectivity. We've got to do the same with healthcare, with, uh, all, uh, with all the other things that are dependent upon that access right now, like applying for jobs, uh, all kinds of things that we need it. So how we do it, I don't have the answer to how we do it, but it's definitely something that the legislature is looking at. What do we need to put in place? What do we need to leverage here to ensure we have that connectivity throughout our state, especially, Holly, in the rural areas where we so desperately need it? Um, I'll just say too about just in general about why I say systemic issue here that we need to look at it's a multi-pronged approach 
reimbursement rates are huge. You cannot you mean expect they are provide huge problem. a huge problem. Yes, Please. Thank you for correcting that. <laughs> I didn't want that to be interpreted wrong. Yeah. <laughs> wrong. Um, it's a huge problem. You cannot expect the providers to continue to provide services when they can't even make their office payroll with what we're reimbursing them with right now. You've got to look at if we're what we can do to encourage people to participate in the systems that we have, and that does have something to do with reimbursement rates. And guess who sets those? The legislature. We have a lot to say in the policies that we, that we make and the budget decisions that we make that impact this beyond what we're specifically talking about today. So, you know, if, in an ideal world, what I would want to see is that all of the stakeholders, we all come together, and we talk about how do we look at the big picture here, where are the different places we need to plug in some solutions so that we can actually make a difference. Right now we do a lot of band-aid approaches to things and sometimes that comes back to bite us because if you're not really addressing the big picture, you say, oh, well, that didn't work because you've just implemented one small piece of it. But the issue of provider access right now, we know we have shortages of both physicians and nurses in Texas. We need to do more to get more physicians and nurses. We, we have issues with uh, GME, with our, our residency training appropriations. We've done better, we've been putting more in. We have some physicians in the House and in the Senate that have been very supportive of making sure we get those things in. And that's gonna make a huge difference in us getting more physicians to stay in Texas, to practice in Texas. We have done some with uh, helping with getting more nurses through the pipeline as well. I personally would love to see, just like GME, that we have GNE. We need to have do a better job of making sure that we're not only getting the nurses through the education pipeline, but that we're providing the residency training that seems to yes. be critical as well for nurses. So there's all kinds of things we could be doing here, but the bottom line with the issue we're talking about today is we have qualified providers that could be providing more access to patients. I, I, I wasn't able to attend the previous um, webinar that y'all had, uh, I'm not sure what to call it, but I know that I heard Holly talk about uh, if we could get past some of the, the things we put in place now, the regulatory mechanisms where we're requiring these contractual arrangements, if we were able to get past, past that and allow people that have been trained like Holly has been, to practice to the full extent of her license and authority, she could use that money to expand what she's already providing in the rural area. We've really got to look at what's smart here and, and, and get past some of these uh, scope of practice issues that we continuously have at the legislature and that most of us hate having. You might notice that the legislators kind of walk away when y'all are yeah. coming toward us like, oh yeah. my gosh, there we go again. Nobody wants to have poor quality care delivered. Nobody. We all want to make sure we have good outcomes, but we need to have evidence-based decision-making here that looks at what's being done with educational preparation, what's being done with oversight, not over-regulating with two different boards regulating this profession. I don't know if that happens with anything else, but there's a lot of things we could do that would make this a better um, opportunity to increase the provider access, and we know we need that. So. I'm still baffled why we can't get there. I just think, to me, it's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, 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 it was at least 10, maybe 15 years ago, uh, speaking, I hate to bring up the subject of money, but we can't get away from it. Um, a good friend of mine was the um, physician, actually he was a pediatrician, um, the um, director of health and human services for the state of New Mexico. And he was speaking about issues just like this in front of the legislature and he said something that I thought the doctors in the legislature were gonna shoot him. He said, we don't need more money. We need it distributed better. And when you look at the flow of dollars in healthcare, what you're going to find, and some people know, but a lot of people don't, over 40% of all healthcare spending produces no care. It, I'm not exaggerating. I can show you evidence to support that statement. So if you think about it for a second, that means, especially after the Affordable Care Act, close to half, given the bureaucracy involved in the Affordable Care Act, 
close to half of the money that we are spending on health care doesn't do our patients any good. It is middlemen, bureaucracy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I look at that number and I say, well, if there's a way we could reduce the cost of bureaucracy and take that money, no put more money into the system, but take that money and use it to pay providers, I would like to see Texas doctors want to take care of Medicaid patients rather than say, I can't afford to do it. And lest you think I'm exaggerating, I will give you personal experience. I get paid, I do procedures in babies with congenital heart disease. Um, the charge for many of the things I do is around four or $5,000. Doesn't matter what the charge is, Medicaid pays me $560, period. And as for primary care, the routine charges are, uh, payments, I'm sorry, payments, are $10, $15 for an office visit. Well, when your overhead for an office is around 60%, how the hell are you gonna keep your doors open? So I would again throw to my colleagues, is, are there ways that you can think of that we can divert back money from, shall we say, uh, non-value adding steps, using the MBA stuff, non-value adding steps to give it to nurses, doctors, hospitals, wheelchair manufacturers. Anybody want to tackle that one? I, I would love to get a real example of that, actually. Please. That will tie this probably all in together. Um, in 2009, we received a grant and started doing telemedicine at one of our rural facilities. And we used that for mental health, which was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. One of our facilities is a foster care facility. And um, so we have quite a challenge in our patient population there. So we did telehealth uh, with psychiatry and, and a good arrangement um, until the funds ran out. And when the funds ran out, then the telemedicine's gone because there was no way to keep that there. Um, if you talk about bureaucracy and funding and things like that and where to get money from, the contractual relationship that really doesn't add to value of patient care would be one way to get that funding and maybe put back in some telemedicine services where we could offer mental health to our patients instead of them having to travel up to two hours, which they're not going to do because they have to take off work and they have kids in the school sure. and have the daycare, and it's costly. And so that, that is a good answer to, and that's a real scenario. I mean, it happened. It's, it's real. You know, the, the governor, what was it, uh, four or five days ago, was talking about um, using tele uh, mental health uh, uh, to reduce school violence. And again, it's one of these things where we don't pay enough attention to avoided cost in doing something that's slightly costly now. A good example would be what you were just saying, tele mental health. Lord only knows how many ER visits and, quite frankly, uh, in, uh, hospitalizations would result from your not being able to counsel some of those foster children. All right, so let me sort of get to the, the real bottom line. You and I were talking yesterday about a vision. The vision being care teams with probably a group of doctors, not one doctor, and a number of um, both, well, specialists as well as generalists in, the, in the, the hub of the wheel, and then nurse practitioners, APRNs, um, in uh, towns of 10,000 or 15,000, directly connected by uh, real time, no retrospective oversight, real time ability to, uh, uh, gee, I got this patient with a rash and I don't know what the heck it is. I'm gonna call my dermatologist expert on the, and show it to him right on the, and you're out in the middle of the panhandle where there isn't a dermatologist for 500 miles. Um, how do we get there? I know I'm asking a big question, I, but I like asking big questions. How do we get there? How do we begin, no, rephrase. How do we begin? What steps should we take to start to get there? 
First of all, I feel strongly that we need to quit s stating stuff that I don't think is accurate. Um, I know that I talked to the Texas Medical Board, and I, and I, with all due respect to what Holly's saying, that contracts, uh, physicians are charging these outrageous contracts to make them practice. I have not seen- You mean one. the PAA? Yes, yeah, PAA. What I'm Tell them what it is. So PAA is basically where uh, nurse practitioners or PAs pay an absorbent amount of money to be able to have a physician oversee them at a cost that is to their bottom line. Like say, for example, Holly comes to me and says, hey, uh, Ray, I would like for you to supervise me. Uh, and I go to Holly and I say, hey, the only way I could do that, you got to pay me a hundred grand. Uh, I think that's completely wrong. I think it's uh, it's it's immoral. I think it's unethical. But but we have yet to see any type of public uh, reprimand because there's not been one case that's been reported to the Texas Medical Board that I that I'm very close with the president of the Texas Medical Board. We want to stop all that. So th I just let, let me let me stop you for one okay. second just to, yeah. so that the people know what's going on. Twenty. 11 or 13? I think 11 was when the PAA came into being, to correct me. 11. 11. Um, and basically what it says is the, um, an, an advanced practice nurse needs to have a delegation by a physician of the ability to write a prescription, prescript, you know, prescriptive authority, and in return, the doctor will oversee, uh, slash supervise, slash mentor, call it what you will, uh, the uh, advanced practice nurse, and there is a uh, fee involved in that. Uh, and I just want them to know that was 2011. Now continue, And please. also clarify what the, over, what the oversight is. All right, now the problem with that was um, the oversight got shall I say, watered down or made somewhat ambiguous as opposed to what we would like, which is real time, of course. And it became retrospective and it was once a month, a certain number of charts for three years and then once quarterly, a number of charts and it was all retrospective. Now go on, please. As, as we move forward, I, my vision is not to do retrospective chart reviews, not to do retrospective um, prescriptive authority, because I think you start to see the quality of health care start to be diluted. And what I mean by that is that I am a true believer in standardization because we're talking about patient lives. And what I mean by that is like medical school is standardized from Texas to Maine to California. So if I go to medical school and Dr. Waldman goes to medical school, wherever he or she might go, we have a standardization based on the type of test, based on the didactics, and based on what we're, what we're being educated to do. We also have a residency program that if I decide to be a board certified anesthesiologist, critical care physician, and Dr. Waldman decides to be a board certified anesthesiologist, critical care physician, he doesn't have to be trained in Texas. He could have been trained in New Mexico, in Ida, uh, you know, Iowa, doesn't matter. My point I'm trying Just to- Just not California. Right. <laughs> My point I'm trying to get to is that I think that what's going on right now from the advanced practice nurse model is that you're not seeing standardizations of didactics. And I can tell you personally that there's a lot of nurse practitioners that have called me personally and said, Ray, you sit on the board of trustees at TMA. I can't find a clinician to even do my clinical hours. I think that we need to get back to the roots and come up with standardization for all APRN education and residencies that could be funded by CNE, but we have to standardize this due to the fact that this isn't a, this isn't a free for all, like somebody doesn't get hurt. These are Texans and lives that we're dealing with. That's why we take it seriously on the, on the physician side. If you don't pass your boards or if you don't pass, you, you're, you're not gonna practice medicine. And with that being said, I would rather go back 
to a community to where we're physician-led organization to where we give nurse practitioners the ultimate authority to practice at the highest level of their license with oversight just to make sure that we're a team. It has nothing to do with hierarchy. I'm not saying I'm better. I mean, I'd be divorced right now if I told everyone <laughs> that my wife is not as good as I am and, and, and I love her to death and she's a nurse. And she said, you know what? I like me seeing patients, but I also like the idea that if I need to bounce something off of yeah. you, I can. I'm not telling her how to practice nursing. I'm just saying that as we move forward, we got to throw out all the arguments and come up with real solutions. And I think the real solutions is that we have to work together, improve communications, and definitely jazz up telemedicine because I think that as we do it right now, I can text you right now, I can send you a video, we can have a complete formal communication and I didn't even have to see you, period. But that technology is out there and every Texan deserves to have that technology. I have so, to- Can I jump in? Oh, please, please. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I, I, there's a lot that you said that I think I could agree with and I do have some differences as well, but uh, the fact is that just as an expectation is that a nurse practitioner will consult with someone who has more expertise in an area is exactly what a physician does who has sure. an area of expertise that they're not qualified to make a decision in. The point of any professional is to know what the limits are of what your ex uh, um, qualifications are to take care of something. And nurse practitioners know what that is. They know when to consult a physician. They want to consult a physician when that's required, just as you would do in your practice if it was a, uh, an area of medicine that you weren't qualified to practice in. So, I mean, I think that that's kind of, uh, to me, it's a, a false argument to a certain extent because that's how we work. We know when to consult with someone else. Um, we don't need to have, I don't think, in place uh, even a real-time supervisor. Yes, absolutely have those that you need to, you know you can contact when something comes up. Holly can talk about how that actually literally, logistically works. But we have been creating, what, in my opinion, I don't see the value of how we've been trying to falsely create this supervision back into something in some way that's not really giving us the value that it purports to do. And protection of patients. Yes, protection of patients. It, but I, what I was going to say in terms of agreement with you, I, I, I disagree that there's not standard uh, you know, educational practices. And we have licensure exams for nurses as well that they have to pass, and they're not going to practice uh, their, their profession if they are not licensed to practice it. That being said, I think we do have issues with uh, looking at how we do our educational programs in this state because we've been under, I guess probably since uh, Governor Perry, there's been a real push to have uh, more online education, uh, more alternatives for, for Texans to choose to get less expensive educational programs, and that has often meant doing more distance learning. That is not bad. There are very good examples of how this works. But I also am concerned, and I have said this to both nurses and physicians, I am concerned about the proliferation of online programs, not just with nursing, but with higher education in general. But absolutely with nursing, I want to make sure that we have programs in place that if they are going to be distance learning programs, that they have evidence-based outcomes that we can really point to. And, and having students have to find their own clinical sites to me is something that I'm trying to address in some way because I do not think that's the best way we need to go, be, go forward with education. So again, going back to my original statement, this is a multifaceted issue that requires that we look at how are we preparing kids in public education to go into the profession? What are we doing to support that? What are we doing in higher education to ensure we have the programs we need, we have the GME we need, we have GNE, whatever we need to do to make sure that they're getting the training they need to be effective providers. What are we doing with reimbursement? I mean, the list goes on and on. There's a lot to be tackled here, but we still need to make sure that we are not getting in the way of those who are qualified to provide, especially when we need that access and especially when it will help us perhaps even have more efficient use of the dollars that we currently have in place for, for help. Yeah, I, I, I have to um, ask everybody, 
uh, this issue, uh, again, something you and I talked about uh, yesterday, which is, um, I hesitate to say this because you shouldn't say it in public, but uh, the fact is we graduated medical school and in my opinion, uh, I can't speak for Ray, but I certainly wasn't qualified to make a good judgment about a difficult patient or even, okay, I didn't. All I had is a lot of book learning, okay? Yeah, passed a lot of tests and so forth. And yes, we did have some clinical experience, but it wasn't, we didn't make any decisions. Medical students don't make decisions. And the only way you learn to do it right is by making a decision that's wrong and hopefully somebody will catch it before. But that's what we do in residency. That's my point. And, and somehow or other, and we have very strict guidelines, physicians, strict guidelines for what you have to do over what period of time in residency in order to call yourself a pediatrician or a pediatric cardiologist or an anesthesiologist. And I, I'm not sure that, that APRNs have that. And if they don't, I think for the protection, rather than leaving it catch as catch can, which is what I'm hearing, if I'm wrong, please correct me. But what I'm hearing is that it's really more left up to the nurse to find rather than we had to get into a residency, apply for and get into a residency, and then spend two, three, five, seven years in training, getting um, a judgment, learning judgment, sorry. Um, and, and I think we need to, I think you, forgive me, need to, I'm gonna pick on you, uh, and need to address that in some way, or the nursing board, whoever, but somebody needs to address that. Would you? Yeah. Sure. Yes, please. Absolutely. So um, I agree with uh, Representative Howard. It's very standardized with regards to education. Um, they all have to graduate from an accredited program. The accreditation is very standardized. Um, everyone has to pass a national certification exam. Uh, that's, that's very standardized. The clinical experience is also actually very standardized. Um, now, some people do have to find their own preceptors, but they still have the criteria they have to meet, and if they don't meet that criteria for that semester, they don't pass that semester. So sometimes it may be taking students longer to actually get through that semester because they haven't met their criteria, because they haven't found preceptors. I know every semester I have sometimes five to six people that will drive, and. They want, I said, you know where I'm at, right? Like we're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and they say yes, and there's like five of them. They're driving from the city so they can get hours. Um, and so, um, and I can't take five at once. My patients, we can't, put, we can't do that. And so we have to be selective in that, um, but they still have to have their hours. Some of the, it, it's, that part is different. Some universities find places, placement for their students, and some let the students find them themselves. However, they all have to meet the same criteria before they can move on. So I believe it's all standardized, but it's in the, and, and I do agree. And actually, TNP is really going to, uh, this session, look into filing some policy solutions for that. That is one of their big goals. And, and unlike residency spots, nothing's funded. So these, these preceptors, like me, who are educating people and training them, I mean, it's all volunteer. So if there were some incentive or some policy that we could utilize, then you have what I would say even more structure to that because then you have people you could rely on consistently. Um, you know, because if I'm out of practice or if my practice gets really, really busy, students take time. I may have to say, look, I can't take any this semester. And um, so does that answer your question? Yes, it does. I. Um I'm, I'm going to pick on my panel. These are all friends, so forgive me. I still want to hear positive steps that we can, we, the three of us, can turn to the representative and say, these are things that we think you should consider doing in this session. Come on, we got a session coming up. What, what would we suggest to her? You, you want to start, Ann or Ray, or I'll, I'll, I'll leave. I'll leave it to the ladies first. <laughs> I, I don't, I, mean I'm not, I'm not, I'm done taking anything off the table. Okay. I want you to, I want you to, whatever you want to say, nothing is off the table. Anything is on the table. Well, I think this, we've only got five minutes left. So yes. I'm just, you know, the conversation. We're still going to have Q&A. 
as noted, has touched on many important topics, and I can't address them all. I think it's really important not to be, uh, to suggest that there may be uh, additional funding that is needed to fund uh, advanced practice nurse education and their training is, is not a substitute for the conversation about whether our current requirement that nurses have these agreements makes sense. And, and I think we haven't even talked about the fact that the vast majority of states don't have this requirement and they're doing just fine. And in the case of New Mexico, they're drawing <laughs> nurses away because they can uh, have a more effective practice in that setting. So I, I, I think it's unwise to suggest that we should not do anything about this thing that's handcuffing nurses uh, in, uh, and denying care. If, if, I, if I may, for one world. second, mm -hmm. and that is just uh, restate what you said. What we have now yeah. is not accomplishing what we need for Texans. So should we change it? I think the answer we'd all agree is yes. The question then becomes and to what? I think part of my problem with this conversation is that because of the job I do and the organization I'm with, I have to be a little bit of a scold to say, you know, there is a point at which cutting and cutting and cutting the amount of money you spent per Medicaid recipient, which Texas has done, we spend less per Medicaid recipient today than we did in 2001. That is not consistent with also being able to pay physicians adequately or nurse practitioners. So, you know, you can't have these conversations independent from understanding what it means to have an adequate and modern revenue system in Texas. And if all you want is a tax cut every session, then don't complain about the level of public services. Uh, I think one more thing I want to say is just that the concern about rural Texas is super valid, that you know having easier access to practice by advanced practice nurses would be beneficial to rural Texans. Rural Texans need good schools and good health care and the ability to have good jobs and the, if they could have not only more practitioners but also insurance that they could afford it's you know and public schools that are funded adequately so those are all incredibly important things which our legislature should be thinking about but i don't think the side arguments should take us away from this specific issue ray you want to we we got a minute left uh <laughs> My thing well, is, if we only have a minute left, then I gotta, I gotta give it to. I, I'm waiting to hear. It. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Go ahead. Uh, my, uh, final comment before we go into questions and answers is that I, I think that as we move forward, that the one thing that I want to continue to stress that it's not a competition. Physicians are trained completely different than nurse practitioners. I don't see that if we are doing something that is unethical as physicians, we should not be doing that, like charging an abundant amount of money. But I still think oversight is very important mm. for collaboration. And the final thing I'll say before we get into questions and answers too, is that as we move forward, I really do believe with the work that they've done, we have to continue to strive to make telemedicine a success because the comment that I made that if, if you look at the schematic of the state of Texas, nurse practitioners and physicians pretty much practice on top of one another except for a small, small few. It's not going to change until you come up with payments where these providers can maintain their practices in rural communities. And with that, I'll... And I will, I will uh, end by adding that uh, we talk telemedicine, but I know he means, and we all mean, I want to be sure everybody understands, telehealth, Correct. because there's telemental health, there's teledentistry, there's telepharmacy, there are all sorts of things that we can get out into the periphery of Texas through teletechnology. And with that, I would be uh, uh, not only willing, but eager to hear any questions that people have. Um, now, where's our roving mic? Here's a young lady. Let me stand up so I can see. Here's a young lady with a question. Is it turned on? Here. 
Um, thank you. Great. I, I would like to ask if you could expand on the statement you made that 40% of healthcare spending produces no healthcare for patients, and if you could put it in layman's terms. Sure. For that, people like me who, who don't understand a lot of the that, analogies that we're That's given. very easy. Uh, a, I will explain it, and B, I'll give you a, a for instance. Um, what I did to get that number, so you, it was actually in a, in a book I wrote. What I, what I did to get that number was I took the federal budget and I looked line by line for every item that went to a hospital, a wheelchair manufacturer, a doctor, uh, a pharmacy, uh, a mental health facility, et cetera. I added all of them up. Obviously, hundreds of billions of dollars. The trouble was I then took the number that was quoted as healthcare spending, and I subtracted one from the other, and I found that 40% of the money we spend as a nation, I cannot speak to Texas because I don't have Texas-specific data, 40% uh, of the money didn't go to a doctor or a pharmacy, a wheelchair manufacturer. Now, um, if you want an example in Texas of where the money's going, um, who, anybody want to tell me the number of employees, not doctors, not nurses, the number of employees of the Health and Human Services Commission for the state of Texas? 62,000 62, employees. Okay? Now, just do the math yourself. You can pick any number you like as to what their salaries are. Because that's healthcare spending. That's Texas healthcare spending. Does that answer your question? Sadly. Any other yes. On that? Uh, say again. Want to take any other perspectives on that? Please do. I would just have to observe that, for one thing, HHSC got uh, like five agencies collapsed into one recently. So that's one reason. Uh, another thing is, this is a state of 28 million people. We have 4 million people on Medicaid and food stamps, and you have to have bodies to actually run those eligibility systems. That includes everybody who staffs your, what used to be called the state schools and the state hospitals. So just a reminder, that, that includes the entire foster care. Or no, that's not true. They're still separate. Nope. They're still yes. separate. They're the only one that's still separate. So that's your entire health department. That's everybody who inspects hospitals, inspects, uh, you know, yeah, right, does water cleanliness and, you know, infectious disease, con disease control and traditional public health. So I just want to say, I don't want to shut down the whole HHSC. And in fact, I, I don't know, either. I know for a fact that our state Medicaid program is run on a skeleton crew compared to other states and that that's one reason uh, people like uh, Representative Howard's office have a hard time sometimes getting the data they need as quickly as they do because they are so few of them working so hard. So I just want to defend my friends at the agency a, a little bit. But I also want to say that, that the analysis that uh, Dr. Wallman ex described doesn't even take into account profit. You know, uh, checks written to stockholders are not delivering health care either. So that's one of the things that, and, and we have a real trade-off there. In Texas, our Medicaid system has evolved in a just really random kind of way, depending on who was the most effective lobbyist in a given session. And so you have a situation where doctors in Texas have not had increases to their Medicaid rates or any cost basis for them for over 20 years, yes. whereas certain other providers uh, actually still have profits from Medicaid. No, and no then there's argument. everything in between. So it's not, uh, you know, it is a very mixed bag and while I think we could all agree that we would like to rearrange some of those efficiencies, there's not going to be anything easy about changing that because the winners are always going to try to hold on. So, Where's our mic? Here's a gentleman right here and then a young lady over there. Yes, my question is about... Uh, what what exactly you're talking about if it, if I understand it correctly that's the number the amount of money spent for not doctors and nurses but people but other people in health care that uh, that are just there to prepare reports or something I don't know where the hell the reports the go and <clears throat> 
they, 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 you always have to fill out way too many forms, and a lot of the doctors hate it, even worse than the patients. Do you think, is that true? That is absolutely true. I will tell you um, the number one complaint that I hear from patients when I ask them, the number two is cost, okay? Number one is, my doctor didn't even look at me. He or she spent most of her his or her time filling out forms, looking at a computer screen, and didn't actually make eye contact. Why are we spending so much, pardon the expression, damn time on forms because we are required to do so. We have to study module. I have to study, I had to study uh, last year. I had to study a module by federal law. I had to study a module on preparing my own sterile solution. Okay? I just want to say that you said the thing that I was trying to say much better. And that's a terrible problem. Dollar efficiency, and let me say this mainly to our representative. We keep talking about cost. What we need to be talking about is dollar efficiency, which is the number of dollars that go into a system, doesn't matter what it is, an organization or, or the whole state, the number of dollars going into a, a, a system that produces the outcome you want from that system. The outcome we want from our system is healthy Texans. There's no good way to measure that. So we're gonna use as a surrogate at timely, access to care. And what I would like to see is numbers that say, this is the amount of money we spent into the system, and this is the amount of money that produced some form of access to some form of care. Well, I can give you an example uh, with, uh, with family planning in terms of uh, having had records on how much money the state was investing, and this is out of our LBB, how much money the state was investing in making sure that women had access to uh, family planning contraceptives, uh, well woman checks. The fact is that the Centers for Disease Control ranked family planning as one of the most, the, one of the 10 most significant events of the last century. Because once we had family planning in place, women were able to space their pregnancies and that resulted in fewer maternal and infant deaths as mm -hmm. well as morbidity. It is a significant thing to be able to do that, and it is much less expensive than premature to, babies. Than premature babies, you betcha. than the NICU, than even having uh, our multiple births, all the things that, that come with that. And so, yes, we do have ways we can quantify some things and show a, more, a smarter way to invest our dollars and have better outcomes. Yes, young lady. I'm, I'm picking on this side. We've got to get over there. Come on. Young. Over there, okay, for sure. Can you give her a mic? Hi, I'd like to thank the panel for your discussion. I'm a retired pediatric neurosurgeon, so I have a, a comment and then some questions. One, you know, I agree that we distribute money and, and the question about where all that money goes is a good, if you look at, as was said, Physician income over the last 20 years has been stagnant. If you look at hospital administrators, the numbers of them have exponentially risen yes, in the true. last 20 years. And the amount of, and their income over the last 20 years has also exponentially risen. They provide no patient care benefit, but they make a hell of a lot of money. Second of all, when you're talking about the, the bureaucracy of things, as a pediatric neurosurgeon, I did surgery on kids who had epilepsy implanting a device to control right. epilepsy. Medicaid approved a, a device implanting a child, and 10 years later when the battery died in a kid who'd gone off all meds and had, had perfect control of his seizures, it was time for his implant. I at that time was in private practice, and my office staff spent two days on the phone with Medicaid to get approval to put in a new battery in his device at a cost I got reimbursed $500 for the surgery, and I spent, I had two office staff working for two days to get the approval. That's the insanity of the system. Now, but back to my questions for, for the panel. You know, I hear continuously about nurse practitioners practicing at the top of their licenses. And it is described as doing diagnosis and treatment of patients you're taking care of in the panhandle. 
the, the code in Texas for the practice of medicine is diagnosis and treatment. And so I'd like to understand from the panel, how is that not practicing medicine? And you continue to say it's practicing advanced practice nursing to the top of your license. To me, it's practicing medicine without a medical license. Second of all, you're talking about access to care and how giving you unsupervised practice will advance access. The fact of the matter is that yes, we have a physician shortage and, it, and Ray has really clearly defined the, some of the problems that we have of why there are access problems. I think that this continuing push to say advanced practice nurses will fill the need why is, why is the nurse practitioner organization pushing to solve the physician crisis by making nurse practitioners physicians, rather than addressing the fact we have a critical shortage of nurses, bedside nurses in hospitals. In 30 plus years as a pediatric neurosurgeon, one time in one month where my surgeries canceled for lack of a physician when I went into labor a month early and had to cancel my elective surgeries. Numerous were the times when I had surgeries canceled because we had no nurses to staff ICU beds or patients. May I suggest that we let them answer your questions? Yeah, okay, well, just let me finish this, okay? So that, and, and everyone knows that patients spend, many patients spend, spend the night in an emergency room because we have no nurses to staff hospital beds. So for the nurse practitioners to be pushing for, let's take over and be Dr. Light instead of trying to advocate for nurses, I mean, we really need good nurses and career paths for nurses and to value our bedside nurses, which we're not doing. You look now- Thank you. Can, Holly, would you like to respond? Sure, well, let's hit the access to care first because that's really the main thing here um, and, and on several levels. In, in states where nurse practitioners have full practice authority, um, more nurse practitioners, um, more patients are seeing access of care has been increased by 23% in some states um, than those who have restricted states. That's first of all. Secondly, if I want to use a real town example, I can tell you about the VA in Amarillo who did put in full practice authority for their nurse practitioners in May of 2017, and now that a year later, 15 months after that, their average wait time for their primary care patient was 16 days, so if you needed to be seen, you were a VA, you called in, you were a new patient, 16 days later you got your appointment. Once full practice, and that cost no money, right? They just did the full practice authority, that cost them no money. Um, once that was installed, and that was effective throughout the VA system, now their average wait time is three days uh, for new patients seeking primary care. So we know it increases access to care, and even conservative think tanks, and on the, on the other side of that, both of those have concluded consensus-wise that allowing nurse practitioners to, with full practice authority increases access to care for patients. So if that's the big issue we need to take home today, I think that's the most important thing. May, may we have someone else speak, please? Thank you. The young lady over there. Thank you. Um, I'm a practicing physician and, can you hear me? Now, okay. yes, good. Um, I'm a practicing physician in Texas and I understand that the, the concerns are access, cost, and for me, safety, patient safety. And a lot of people are talking about access and cost and I think that it's important for physicians who are seeing this play out with real patients, that we speak up um, on behalf of patients and patient safety. And what I'm trying to say without being, uh, I'm not trying to be derogatory, I'm just trying to state the facts that the, the training between a nurse and a nurse practitioner is vastly different than that of a physician who's gone to medical school and a residency, and the, the, um, the, the, a good example of that is, um, it, well, I'm, I'm involved in a, a group of about 10,000 physicians. It's called Physicians for Patient Protection, and uh, we are very concerned about safety. We are seeing that, um, Representative Howard said that, uh, th that they know when to refer. 
I'm seeing inappropriate referrals, which is increasing cost. I'm seeing missed diagnoses, and I'm having to clean up uh, mismanagement from nurse practitioners in our community. Um, and I, I think that it's important for me to, and other physicians who, who see this playing out, um, to just let the public know and let legislators know and let young nurse practitioners know that there is a, there is a knowledge gap and it's a quality of care gap. And so when you're looking at access and cost, I think you also need to really focus on safety. And uh, my final comment on that before I ask what your uh, response is, is that uh, we have nurse practitioners in our group of physicians who, are, who went back, they practiced as nurses and nurse practitioners, they went back to medical school and they are acutely aware of the differences and they know that they weren't prepared to practice um, as a physician does. A physician will, knows how to diagnose, come up with a broad differential diagnosis for the symptoms um, and come up with a treatment plan. The, the second part of that is carrying out a treatment plan or a protocol, and I think that nurse practitioners are wonderful at that, and some of them who have been practicing with physicians for 20 years are wonderful at even making diagnoses, but, they, but the young ones who are going out, they don't know what they're getting into. I think the, the upper, um, the, the uh, nurse practitioner groups are sort of pushing, putting the cart before the horse, so to speak, that they've decided this is the answer. Some nurse practitioners are, are having training that's online and it's, it's uh, they go out and then they're expected to be uh, given the opportunity, uh, given the opportunity to treat patients and I'm really concerned about patient safety. So my comment, Thank you. my question is, what, do you have any comments regarding safety? Anybody want to comment or I, I'm happy? all familiar with the literature so I guess one of my curiosities is it seems like all of the peer-reviewed literature has found comparable safety for advanced practice nurses yeah uh, I know let the me, VA let system me, you probably let know me, the let me uh, than let I. me follow up with that um, last session I actually uh, gave the legislature I don't know if you remember uh, representative Howard I gave the legislature I did my homework. I gave the legislature a blue binder, one of those three ring binders that was, I'm not exaggerating, it was about this thick. It had 124 articles that I'd reviewed in nursing literature, medical literature, um, uh, some lay, but most of it was peer reviewed. And almost to an article, they said that there was not, on a statistical basis, there was not a um, safety issue, number one, and number two, I really have to, if I may, argue, and that is I don't think anybody, certainly anybody on this dais, and most of the public, nobody thinks that a doctor, that an APRN is equivalent to a family practice physician. I'm only talking pri uh, uh, primary care here, okay? Nobody will make that claim. What we, I think, will claim is that they, uh, nurse practitioners, are qualified to do certain things and to triage patients. And when there is a question or it's beyond your training or knowledge, you know enough to make a referral. And that would be my response. Anyone else care to? Yeah, I know, but I, I, I wanna give the panel the final word. She's, she's telling me it's time's up, but I still wanna give the panel the final word. I would just say, yeah, the quality data is there. Um, and so um, basically, for if, if we wanted to sum up this, um, allowing advanced nurse practitioners to function at their, at their training and education saves money, it improves quality of care, and it absolutely increases access to care. In the counties I practice, we have zero physicians, zero hospitals, and we have a huge patient database, and we pull from other counties. And if, our, if my clinics weren't there, no one, no one would. Here's the deal. When I first moved in, there was one county was three years with no health care. So when I moved in and started asking patients, so where have you been going, where have you been going? And these are patients with heart failure, hypertension, diabetes. Uh, the answer was nowhere. Okay, so if we're not there, they don't go anywhere. And then we have huge ER cost, huge hospitalization cost, and so it's a problem. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for your attention.